So today uh, I chose to talk about acute otitis media in children because it is a very uh, basic and primary topic and something we see quite commonly. And it's always nice for me um, to review some of these um, common things that we see in clinic to make sure we're all up to date and, and staying current with how we practice. And it's also nice that last week we heard from Tenzile about audiology and hearing loss. Um, these two topics are, are common in our patients um, and go hand in hand. So some of my objectives, Dr. Florence mentioned, we'll go over some definitions, review basic anatomy, um, go over epidemiology and pathogenesis of acute otitis media, common presentations and how to diagnose it, manage, and then the common complications we can see. So first we'll start with a few definitions just to, to get us all on the same page. Um, a middle ear effusion is when there's fluid in the middle ear cavity, and this can occur with acute otitis media or without infection. And so just having a middle ear effusion doesn't necessarily mean that there's acute otitis media or infection present. Um, acute otitis media is when there is a presence of an effusion, but also a bacterial infection of that middle ear fluid it can also be referred to as superative otitis media. And then otitis media with effusion is when there's middle ear fluid present that isn't infected. And that middle ear fluid could be secretory or serous, usually clear or gray, and not um, pus. And I'll show some pictures a bit later on. And then chronic superative otitis media, something I think we all um, have seen pretty commonly. And this is um, more associated with a perforated tympanic membrane and purulent odorrhea or purulent drainage from the ears that goes on for at least longer than two or three weeks. And all of these can be along the same spectrum um, of disease. So having an effusion comes before acute otitis media, and you can even treat acute otitis media and have a fusion that um, is present post-treatment for several weeks even. So they're all kind of within the same um, disease spectrum and timeline. So just to review a bit of anatomy so that we can all um, remember how these things play out, uh, looking at the top picture, going from the left, you have the oracle or the outer ear that um, signifies the start of the external ear. And that goes into the external auditory canal or the external ear. Um, then we meet the tympanic membrane, which is the start of the middle ear. Connected to the tympanic membrane are the um, ossicle bones. Um, so that's the malleus connected to the incus to the stapes. And these bones connect the tympanic membrane to um, the round window or oval window that leads to the inner ear, which is how sounds get transmitted, as Tenzile taught us last week. Um, and all of these bones are running through the middle ear. The middle ear space then is open and freely connected to the eustachian tube, which is the tube that runs from the middle ear space down to the nasopharynx, and it's also openly connected to the nose, the throat. Um, it's one big opening normally during um, healthy times. And surrounding uh, these structures, um, is the mastoid air cells and the mastoid bone. Um, so sometimes complications can arise in these surrounding structures when acute otitis media is present. The facial nerve also, if you can see it there, runs through the middle ear space. In the bottom two pictures, um, on the left, this is an otoscopic view of a normal tympanic membrane, and then on the right, um, just pointing out some of the common structures we see. So <clears throat> in this normal view of the tympanic membrane, you can really see the ossicles. Um, so the main ossicle running down is the malleus, um, which uh, ends in the middle of the tympanic membrane with the umbo of the malleus. And near the top of the malleus, is an area called the pars flaccida. And that's part of the tympanic membrane that is the most malleable or, or flexible and soft area 
um, that's more freely movable. And we'll talk about how that's important later as well. Um, and then the light reflex. So <clears throat> in, in the inferior corner, there's a, a light reflex, or sometimes we call it um, a cone of light. And that is a, is a common thing we look for in normal tympanic membrane or normal otoscopic exams. So for epidemiology, um, acute otitis media is most common between 6 to 24 months of age. Um, there is a small rise again that can occur around five to six years when um, children are starting school, uh, but <clears throat> it's really infrequent or much more infrequent in school-going children and teenagers. Um, some risk factors uh, for more severe disease or recurrent disease is when you see cases in children under six months of age, um, they're at higher risk for recurrent acute otitis media. Um, if a child hasn't had a case of acute otitis media by two years, and they're really unlikely to go on to have um, a case or have recurrence or complications. And important to note, we did note um, a decline in cases of acute otitis media and complications secondary to uh, pneumococcal vaccines, which are now pretty routine in, in our infants. So that brought down the incidence of acute otitis media quite a lot. <clears throat> and I will say, I think um, good access to ART and viral load suppression rates in the country being um, what they are, we also have seen uh, far fewer cases. Um, since I've been at Baylor, even since 2017, I've seen far fewer cases of, of acute otitis media and chronic superlative otitis media over these years. So some risk factors for developing acute otitis media include family history. So sibling parents with acute otitis media put, um, are already risk factors for a child. Attending daycare or large preschools, uh, which basically uh, equates to being exposed to lots of colds and flus, <laughs> so lo lots of upper respiratory tract infections. Tobacco smoke or environmental smoke within the home or around the home and air pollution are, are risk factors. Um, and then these are all more common in the fall and winter months when their respiratory pathogens are higher. One protective factor that some evidence has shown that breastfeeding can be protective against otitis media. And this is really any breastfeeding. Some evidence that shows that exclusive breastfeeding, at least for the first three months, can protect for the first year of life, and for six months can protect up to the first two years of life. And the mechanism of this really isn't clear. Um, there's some thought that it's pass, um, passing of um, immunity or something that affects the immune system of the child from breastfeeding from the mom. Um, or there's some anatomical um, development that occurs differently in children who are breastfeeding um, from their the facial structures. So why does this occur more common in children than in adults? If you look at the photos or the pictures on the left, <clears throat> in an infant, the eustachian tube positioning is horizontal. It's um, shorter and more floppy than in adults. So in the adult picture, you can see the eustachian tube is more angled. So, and because again, like it's so open and, and free between the middle ear and the nasopharynx, anytime there's an upper respiratory tract infection and the nose is blocked, all that fluid can freely move straight through the eustachian tube up into the middle ear. <clears throat> and when there's inflammation, with those infections, if you remember from the picture from before, the eustachian tube is small and thin, and so any inflammation can cause edema and swelling, um, and any debris can clog and, and obstruct the eustachian tube. So any fluid that ends up trapped in the middle ear can go on to be infected. Um, so, so that's why it's more common in children. And as they age, we see um, far fewer cases as children grow because the eustachian tube positioning changes. So a little bit about um, pathogenesis. So like I mentioned, this whole system of the middle ear um, is open from the nose to the eustachian tube, um, including the mastoid air cells that are uh, surrounding the middle ear. They're all um, very connected, their epithelium, respiratory epithelium runs throughout all of them. So any infection in the nose can cause that, can lead to inflammation throughout the system. 
So generally the process that we see um, in children is they'll have a viral upper respiratory tract infection or URI, cold or flu. Um, <clears throat> And they are already pre-colonized with probably some of these bacterial pathogens that cause acute otitis. And so <clears throat> once there's edema or inflammation in the respiratory mucosa of the nose and the nasopharynx, it can lead also um, affect the eustachian tube and lead to obstruction. And then that leads to negative middle ear pressure. Secretions accumulate normal viruses and bacteria that colonize the tract are there and they can grow leading to purulence, um, bulging of the tympanic membrane, uh, fluid and debris there, uh, and inflammation of the tympanic membrane, just which are what we commonly think of when we think of um, how to diagnose this. The most common pathogens usually associate with acute otitis media um, include streptococcus pneumoniae or strep pneumo, um, hom non-typable haemophilus influenza, and Morxella cateralis. Before infant pneumococcal vaccines, strep pneumo accounted for 60 to 70 percent of acute otitis media, but now that we're post-immunizations, um, those numbers have really gone down and haemophilus and Morxella are, have increased. Um, strep pneumo now counts for about 25% worldwide of the causes of otitis media, <clears throat> um, with penicillin resistance more common after recurrent or persistent infection or recent antibiotic use. There is an increase in resistance to amoxicillin, but using high dose amoxicillin still can be enough sometimes to overcome that common resistance. When a child has infection with strep pneumo, um, this can be associated with higher fever, more severe ear pain, and can lead to more complications like perforated tympanic membranes and mastoiditis. When a child's infected with haemophilus or non-typable H flu, um, this is, makes up more of like 50% of cases now, and there is some more common resistance worldwide to penicillin and, and these um, bacteria. They more commonly are associated with bilateral cutitis media, and we frequently see conjunctivitis in, in these kids. So if you see conjunctivitis and acute otitis media, think non-typable H flu, um, and they are more likely to have um, beta-lactamase resistance, which is something that might make you turn to amoxiclav or, um, rather than amoxicillin, but we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. Um, and non-typable H flu puts us at more risk for treatment failure, recurrence, and chronicity. And then Morixella uh, is, uh, accounts for fewer cases, about 15%. This is typically less severe than uh, pneumococcal disease and, and also can have some penicillin resistance. So for clinical presentation, just some common things. These are not diagnostic, but... Um, really helpful with it, making the diagnosis. Um, ear pain, ear rubbing, um, hearing loss, ear drainage, and fever, these are all common symptoms in older children. And we can see fever in up to two thirds, but not always is fever present. Um, ear pain is one of the most common and best predictors, um, but in children under two, it's less common. They can't really tell you necessarily how they're feeling or if they have pain. And so you might see more, uh, you might see less specific signs like fussiness, restless sleep, poor feeding, vomiting, and diarrhea. So to diagnose this, you really need um, an otoscopic exam is most ideal. And um, so this is just some images, uh, again, of a normal tympanic membrane on the left. And then on the right, just pointing out some basic structures to keep in mind. So <clears throat> when you use an otoscope to diagnose to, uh, acute otitis media, a lot of times there's wax present and that can obscure your view. So it's important to try to clean some of that out. And what we do um, is just some gentle syringing with warm fluid to try and clean out the, the external canal. You can also use like a speculum or, or um, an, a little ear scoop, but we don't have those really, it's, it's 
more easy in our setting to, to use a bit of warm water, but you want to be sure to use warm water so that um, you don't cause um, uh, reactions in, in children. It can be really painful um, with cold water and sometimes they can get uh, nauseous and throw up on you. That's not fun. Um, <clears throat> so once you've cleared out the earwax and taken a look at the tympanic membrane, just a couple of structures again to point out. Um, it's nice to remember that when you're looking at the tympanic membrane, you can, you, we very easily just kind of take one glance and, and fail to see some specific structures. So it's good to use sort of a systemic, a systematic um, look at it. So if you follow the line of the malleus down, um, that gives us uh, the midline. So that is one way to separate. And then you put a horizontal line in the middle as they do on the picture on the right and breaks up the tympanic membrane into quadrants. So when you're looking through your otoscope, I mean, especially in children, you have like, you know, three seconds before they kick you. <laughs> it's good to quickly have a systematic way and just go through each quadrant quickly rather than one big glance. Sometimes when we look quickly, we miss um, some certain findings if, if they're not in the, in the middle. So again, I mentioned at the beginning, the pars flaccida is in the um, superior portion of the tympanic membrane, and that's the, a, a more freely mobile, um, flexible part of the tympanic membrane. Um, and then the pars tensa is this lower portion of the tympanic membrane that's more tight and taut um, and tense. So a lot of times perforations occur there. But when they occur in the pars flaccida, you have to be a little bit more worried about something like a cholesteatoma, which we'll talk about a bit later. And then down at the bottom, um, I just included a small picture of a pneumatic otoscope. So if, in, if you look at most of those otoscopes that are around, they may have a little hole on the side, and that's for connecting one of these pneumatic tubes. Um, th these are not widely available, and we don't have one here, And but I think some of you guys might. It is a little rubber bulb that you can use. Uh, so you place the otoscope speculum into the ear canal, and once it forms a tight seal, you can just gently squeeze the, the bulb to allow some air through into the canal. And um, in a patient with no effusion, um, you should see some wiggling or some movement of the tympanic membrane. That would be normal. Um, when there's an effusion, though, it puts some pressure on the tympanic membrane, and when you push the bulb to allow some air in, you won't see any movement. So not seeing movement when you apply pressure on the bulb um, can be a sign that there's an effusion present. So this can just help with your diagnosis of um, otitis media with effusion or acute otitis media. And then one other thing I just wanted to mention um, <clears throat> is digital otoscopy is a, an up and coming thing. Um, we don't have it, I haven't seen it, but I, I've certainly seen ads when you start looking for otitis media but, um, online. But there, there are devices available that you can attach to your smartphone. So when you do your otoscopic exam, you can take pictures. Um, there's also cameras being developed that can attach to an otoscope so that, you know, yes, in the three seconds that you have to look at a child's tympanic membrane before they kick you, you can take a picture and then be able to um, reference it later with maybe an expert or someone else or, um, so that those can be nice devices once they're um, really more available. So like I said, diagnosis requires um, an otoscopic view. Um, to officially make the diagnosis, you want one or more uh, of a bulging tympanic membrane or signs of acute inflammation, which can include redness of the tympanic membrane as seen in the bottom photo. Um, other signs of inflammation can be fever or severe ear pain. Um, and you need the presence of a middle ear effusion. So not just having an effusion gives you acute otitis media. You need to have either inflammation and or a bulging tympanic membrane. Other ways to help you diagnose is with this pneumatic otoscopy where you could see decreased or absent mobility with a 
applying a little bit of air pressure. And then you can also make the diagnosis if there's a perforated tympanic membrane and pus draining out of the ear, that's a pretty good sign. As long as you can tell that the external ear canal is not inflamed and that it's not otitis externa. One thing I'll point out with the inflammatory signs, and I'll show you a picture later on as well, is that sometimes inflammation or redness of the tympanic membrane can fool you. Um, when, when kids are crying and fighting um, or they have a high fever, um, you can get a similar look <laughs> to the red vessels. So sometimes if all you see is inflammation, that also is not a sign that it's acute otitis media. When we're also manipulating with the otoscope, trying to dig around and go different angles, that can also lead to some redness. Um, and then when we're trying to get earwax out. So continuously, um, you know, pouring warm water into the ear and sucking it out over and over can also cause some inflammation of the vessels there. So you want to be careful not to just use inflammation as um, your way to diagnose acute otitis media. So these are just some other photos to look at for reference. Um, in the top left, this would be sort of like an earlier acute otitis media. There's some inflammation there you can see and a little bit of bulging. Um, in the, the second picture on the top right, B, um, some of the fluid, you can see some of fluid there, the, the yellow line or cut off of yellow, like an air fluid level. Um, this is pus like thick you can tell it's kind of looks thick and yellow there um, and then there's really not a whole lot of inflammation uh, but you can tell maybe there's a little bit of bulging and you don't see that cone or light reflex um, as we normally see in a normal exam and in C this uh, is just a, a middle ear that's full of pus um, there's no air fluid levels or bubbles. It's just lots of pus there. There is some inflammation or vasodilation of the vessels, um, and it's bulging quite a lot. And really what's happening is the tympanic membrane is adhered to the malleus, and so the fluid is pushing and causing a lot of pressure around that, uh, around that area. It kind of looks like a, like a donut or something. So this is what otitis media with the fusion looks like. Um, <clears throat> so otitis media with a fusion is not acute otitis media. I know I've said that, but I'll just like to say it again. In this photo, there's present uh, presence of a an effusion with clear or grayish fluid, but it's not pus, and there's no inflammation or bulging. And you can see the air is just pointing out some bubbles. So just having the effusion doesn't mean there's infection. Um, you can have a fusion for uh, various other reasons like allergies or um, other things. And I love this picture I just wanted to show because um, this is the same patient, tympanic membrane of the same patient. In the first picture, sitting comfortably, um, everything looks normal. There's your cone of light, light reflex. There's no inflammation in the vessels surrounding the tympanic membrane and no signs of fluid there. In the picture on the right, this patient was asked to do a Valsalva maneuver. And what you can see is now it looks really inflamed, right? The, there's vasodilation. This tympanic membrane looks angry. <laughs> you might be like tempted to say there's otitis, acute otitis media here. But it's important to remember there's no effusion and no bulging. So there's no signs of, of infection in that middle ear space. But this is the kind of inflammation or the kind of vasodilation that might fool you in a child who has a normal tympanic membrane or middle ear space, but they're crying and they're fighting you um, or you've just like <laughs> syringed, you know, a lot of fluid into their ear. Okay, so how do we manage um, acute otitis media? Uh, so I'll just briefly mention your choices are really antibiotics or not. And 100% of the time, you know, with my patient population, and I'm sure all of ours, um, antibiotics are always the right choice rather than observation. But <clears throat> I'll just mention very briefly about observation as well. Um, 
Children who are at increased risk of severe infection for acute otitis media, you definitely want to be sure to start antibiotics soon, and that's infants less than six months, anyone who, who is immunocompromised, so that includes HIV, um, if they're toxic or ill-appearing, or they have some baseline craniofacial abnormalities, so cleft palate or some anatomical differences that come with Down syndrome. Um, Without antibiotics, acute otitis media in a patient who's not at risk can resolve often within three to seven days. Um, it may leave a, an effusion that can take up to six weeks or, or three months even to resolve. Um, but antibiotics really help to hasten recovery and provide pain relief and prevent some of the complications we'll discuss a bit later. Um, so for children not at increased risk of severe infection, um, so those are older children, over to mild symptoms, you could think about observation. And really, I only leave this in because sometimes you may have a family um, who doesn't want antibiotics. So <laughs> if you're having a discussion with them about to start or not to start, if the child doesn't have risk factors for um, complications or, or um, treatment failure, then you, it could be reasonable to offer um, waiting on antibiotics for uh, two or three days. And so usually what that might look like is... Dr. Mimi? Yes? Um, your, your slides aren't progressing. Are you able to um, maybe... Yes, now we can see where you are. They were stuck on the tympanic membrane before. Yes, oh, okay. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Florence. Do you want to, what do you see now? Uh, management. Okay, cool. Thank you for letting me know. Um, okay, so like I was saying, what observation could look like is if you give a child, uh, give a family the antibiotic and they're kind of keen on avoiding antibiotics, you can say, okay, I think there's an infection here, but you can wait a day or two and see what happens. Maybe it will get better on its own without the antibiotic. But if the child's still having pain in a day or two, or the fevers are still there in a day or two, you should start antibiotics. And this is really something I would only offer a child who's not at high risk. So the things I mentioned before, like um, less than two years or having some baseline risk factors. So really be more likely to avoid this um, if they're under two or if they're over two with severe symptoms, so already having ear pain for more than two days, high fever, if they have bilateral disease or they've already perforated their tympanic membrane and have otorrhea, um, or if follow-up is uncertain. And so for these reasons, I don't offer this in my patient population. A lot of people are coming from far and have already had symptoms for a few days. So it's really, um, in the patients I see, not an option that I would offer, but I just wanted to let um, to include that still. One other thing to remember when you're treating acute otitis media is that pain is a really big symptom for kids, and we we kind of do um, we don't always do a good job of acknowledging their pain and treating it. And acute otitis media can be quite severe, so. You want to make sure you're including with your antibiotics um, paracetamol and or ibuprofen. Um, and for kids, you can alternate this every three to four hours, give paracetamol, and then alternate with um, ibuprofen. Uh, and if the pain is really severe, you can give the two together even. Um, that would be okay also. So for antibiotic management, um, the, the first line is our friend amoxicillin, which we use quite a lot. Um, it's important to know that uh, first line is put in the Esotene guidelines and South African guidelines is high dose amoxicillin. So for acute otitis media, that is 90 milligrams per kilogram per day in two divided doses. Um, we use high dose amoxicillin because of the prevalence of penicillin resistance. Um, that we see in some of our ear infections. Lower doses are okay um, if there's less of this penicillin resistance, but recommended in, in our local uh, first-line guidelines is high dose, uh, in our ear infection guidelines is um, high dose amoxicillin. And using a high dose amoxicillin um, 
can increase the concentration of the antibiotic that makes it into the middle ear. And this provides activity against most of the strains of uh, strep pneumo that are there. Amoxy, amoxicillin clavulanate or amoxiclav, we would turn to as first line if there's a risk of beta lactamase or, or resistant or an, an resistant mechanism against amoxicillin. And so in patients who might have received amoxicillin in the past month or they have uh, conjunctivitis at the same time as the titus, so then you're thinking non-typable H flu, um, or if they have recurrent acute otitis media that's not responsive to amoxicillin, you want to look to amoxiclav. Um, and that uh, would be a similar dosing of the amoxicillin portion to high dose amoxicillin. As far as duration goes for antibiotics, Really, if your patient is high risk, like some of those groups that I mentioned, under two, or the, the tympanic membrane is already perforated, it's a recurrent episode, you want to treat for 10 days. If they are not as high risk, it's like a milder episode, you could go for five to seven days. Some alternative options, if there's penicillin resistant uh, allergy, so if it's a mild allergy just with a rash that came a few days after giving penicillin, you can still use an oral cephalosporin. Um, not quite as good in the middle ear, but something you could try. And also, ceftriaxone IM. So uh, this is not child-friendly to give an injection, of course, but <laughs> you can give 50 milligrams per kilogram. Um, of an intramuscular injection. Um, just one dose for mild infection can be enough. If it's a recurrence or a severe infection, you could do one dose daily for three days. Um, and if it's a serious allergy like anaphylaxis or um, a delayed reaction like Stevens-Johnson or TEN, you could think about azithromycin or clindamycin. But all of these are really not as good as um, amoxicillin and amoxiclav at getting into the ear um, and treating the common pathogens. Okay, so for treatment failure, treatment failure <clears throat> in, is defined as when a child doesn't improve after two to three days from starting antibiotics. So then you want to think treatment failure. And that can be um, either from a complication that's developed um, from the infection. Maybe the antibiotic choice is wrong and there's resistance um, already present, or maybe they're, they're not using it appropriately, or maybe we made the wrong diagnosis and it's not even acute otitis media, it's something else. Um, and then recurrence is, there's early recurrence and late recurrence. And an early recurrence is when you see symptoms and infection arise again within two weeks after successful treatment. So you've completed um, your course of antibiotics, the child is better, and then within two weeks from the end of treatment, they have return of infection. That's an early recurrence, and you want to think that's probably persistence of the original pathogen. Um, so in early recurrence and in treatment failure, if you gave amoxicillin, you could go to amoxiclav. If you gave a different antibiotic first, like a cephalosporin, um, you can try ceftriaxone and intramuscular injections. Um, and then uh, alternatively, there's, you could also try levofloxacin, but not, um, not a common choice either. If it's a late recurrence, so it comes two weeks after successful treatment, um, then you want to think maybe it's a different pathogen and you could try um, amoxiclav. If failure persists, even after your intramuscular ceftriaxone, um, you really want to think about referring to your ENT surgeons um, for a culture of the pus that's present. And that's not uh, getting a swab from the external ear. That means, I mean, to get a really good sample, they will have to go into the middle ear. And so how they do that is with um, a therapeutic tympanocentesis. So the the lower picture is uh, just a cartoon image, obviously, of what that might look like, but um, that could be taking a needle and going into the middle ear through the, through the tympanic membrane and removing some of the pus there. Yes, it's painful, but um, it relieving a lot of that pressure that um, has built up in the middle ear can, can help a lot with the pain.
from the infection and then getting a <clears throat> getting a good um, sample for culture can help with your um, treatment options. And then tympanostomy tube or myringotomy tubes, um, as you see in the right picture, um, these can be used especially for kids who have recurrent acute otitis media and are at severe risk for re recurrence. Um, and so uh, some people might think of this when a, a child has more than three distinct separate episodes within six months or four episodes within a year. And I'll just plug, since I'm at Baylor, <laughs> that if you're seeing some of these things recurrent, like recurrent acute otitis media or chronic superative otitis media, you also want to think about HIV and make sure people are up to date with their HIV um, testing, even in children and older children. So after recovery of infection, uh, all children should be reassessed at some point for resolution of effusion. And that's mainly because, as we also heard last week with Tenzile with audiology, having an effusion is associated with conductive hearing loss. Um, and so having an effusion in a child can feel like to them they have plugs in their ears, so hearing can be um, diminished. Especially in children under two or those greater than two with some baseline learning or language um, issues already, you want to consider trying to do a follow-up otoscopic exam um, at around three months or so post-infection. It can take about, you know, by 12 weeks after infection, most middle ear effusions should have resolved. Um, for all other children who are not at, at more increased risk for hearing loss, um, you can just check at their normal growth monitoring exams. So how to prevent recurrence? There's just some um, interventions you can talk about with parents um, and educate about. What counts as recurrent, as I mentioned before, is having greater than three episodes in six months or four episodes in a year. And really the prevalence of this has decreased a lot since introduction of pneumococcal vaccines in our infants and with improvement in ART. Some interventions that you can discuss with your patients, you know, you, you want to identify and treat any predisposing conditions. So even prolonged use of a of a pacifier um, for longer than six months um, can be a risk factor. Exposure to cigarette smoke and smoke in the home, being up to date on HIV testing and immunizations, um, large daycare settings, and then talking to your families about the protective impact of breastfeeding. It may be too late with the child you're seeing because they're already older, but still it's good for families to know for future children because of the, the uh, family <clears throat> because family history can play a role. So if there's another child, they have another child, they could still benefit from knowing that. Um, and then some more uh, medical interventions to consider with kids who are at higher risk for recurrence will include antibiotic prophylaxis. So you could think about giving um, low-dose moxicillin daily for maybe up to six months. Um, but this, you know, is not something I would take lightly. Um, obviously, there's a lot of risk. Uh, side effects with antibiotics and amoxicillin, even though we use it a lot, still does have side effects and using it for that long um, can cause things like diarrhea or rash. Um, but if you were to do it, it'd be best to try and do it during the late fall when you in winter when you actually see a lot more um, cases. The other thing is surgery. So we mentioned myringotomy or tympanostomy tubes um, to help with drainage. And I think I didn't say before, but the, one of the really great things about the tubes is that and and a tympanocentesis is is creating a hole to allow drainage of the pus is helpful so that the middle ear can air out and really um become dry and and that helps to heal just as we do with like um skin and soft tissue abscesses you know sometimes just drainage is enough to really um to really help the body cure that infection and then the other option is expected management and that's just waiting and treating each episode as they occur so factors when trying to choose which intervention, um, those kids who are at higher risk of recurrence and uh, complications, so you might consider something a little bit more aggressive. So that's like younger kids, less than six months at the first time that they had acute otitis media, if there's a, a heavy um, family history, um, maybe if they have a history of autism or developmental delay or language delay, 
that means that using more aggressive measures may help prevent more uh, infections, which may lead to less hearing loss. Um, and in those kids who are already at risk, you want to really try to help them not have hearing loss so they can develop um, the best that they can. Um, and these less aggressive interventions, you know, expected management is probably better for kids over two years without other risk factors because as they age, um, the incidence of acute otitis media really drops off. And that's because of the positioning of the eustachian tube that we mentioned at the beginning. Um, as they age, the eustachian tube becomes more angled. And so some of that fluid from the nose and nasopharynx isn't as easily, easily able to go back there. So, you know, once a kid is over two, um, some of these more aggressive measures uh, may not be as useful as they are for the younger kids and those at higher risk. So I'll just touch on a few complications um, from acute otitis media. So hearing loss is a big one like that we already learned about. Um, most kids with acute otitis media go on to have some amount of conductive hearing loss from that middle ear fusion. The fluid can stick around for a few months. Um, and like I said, it's the equivalent of putting a plug in their ear. So, and, and what happens is when the fluid is there, it can keep the ossicles in the tympanic membrane from vibrating appropriately. So the sound doesn't get conducted as well. <clears throat> so it's important to get these kids um, hearing tested. Uh, with an audiologist. Having a perforated tympanic membrane, so this is a common complication, especially if uh, a child goes without antibiotics for too long. Uh, pressure builds up behind the tympanic membrane, which can lead to central ischemia and necrosis of the tympanic membrane, and then spontaneous perforation occurs, um, allowing the pus from behind in the middle ear to come out as odorrhea. <coughs> And most of the time, a perforated tympanic membrane occurs in this lower portion, the pars tensa, that's, that we mentioned before, um, like in this upper picture. But you can see uh, what looks like a perforated tympanic membrane in the upper portion or the pars flaccida that I mentioned earlier. And sometimes that can fool you. So if you think that it's a perforated tympanic membrane in the pars flaccida area in the superior um, it may actually be a cholesteatoma that's causing problems. Like in the lower picture, um, that is of a cholesteatoma. Cholesteatomas are when there's abnormal growth of the squamous epithelium in the middle ear. And this actually can go on to destroy um, the surrounding tissues, including the ossicles. Um, so it can be quite a serious complication. Um, you can see deep retraction pockets in the tympanic membrane. And in this lower picture, it, it's kind of eroding into the nearby structures. Um, but it can, it can go on to even um, affect the mastoid bones. So it's quite serious, and it can lead to hearing loss as well. Um, Meringosclerosis, that's when you get whitish plaques that form on the tympanic membrane. And this is just a calcification of the connective tissue there. It's usually not functionally important, but if it occurs around where the ossicles are, it can cause conductive hearing loss. Um, chronic supportive otitis media, we'll talk about a little bit more in detail in the next few slides. You can also see mastoiditis. Let me just show a picture of this one. Um, mastoiditis is when the mastoid air cells are affected by infection and inflammation from the acute otitis media. Um, so rarely it can worsen to pus actually getting into those air cells as well. And I like this picture because to me, this whole system, it's really nice to see photos and, and understand um, physically what's happening. But once the acuotitis media is there, you see kind of the deeper red um, or inflammation around the middle ear space in this respiratory epithelium is blocked the eustachian tube and the pus is trapped. And so sometimes that inflammation can um, extend into the mastoid air cells and cause mastoiditis. Um, and you might see that with some pain behind the auricle. This is a severe complication and probably merits referral to your ENT surgeons. Um, another thing you might see is facial nerve palsy. So remember from the beginning, the facial nerve runs through the middle ear. So sometimes you could see facial nerve palsy. 
And then um, there, be, there can be balance and motor problems if some of the inflation, inflammation reaches the inner ear and affects the vestibular system. Um, and then more rare and more serious are intracranial um, or extracranial complications that include things like meningitis, brain abscesses, lateral sinus thrombosis or cavernous sinus thrombosis, um, subdural empyemas, and carotid artery thrombosis. And all that's like super scary things, but hopefully at that point they are seeing um, the specialist. And these are just some photos to, show, to point out what retraction and cholesteatoma could look like. On the left is a picture of a retraction of the tympanic membrane. So you can see <clears throat> in, the, in the top portion where the P is, that's the pars flaccida. And the tympanic membrane, is, instead of being a normal, like, round, um, convex shape, it's kind of being sucked down. Um, and so that, that's what retractions. And when there's a retraction present, um, here on the right, this is a cholesteatoma. You really want to be worried about cholesteatomas because, like I mentioned, this is um, squamous epithelium or skin cells that really um, can go on to erode everything in this area. And they kind of look like this um, greasy, uh, yeah, these like greasy cells coming forth. They just keep. Um, expanding and will take over what's in their um, what's in their way. So it can be the middle ear bones um, or the nearby structures. Okay, so lastly, I just want to go over chronic superative otitis media because this is something we commonly see as a complication from acute otitis media. And as a reminder, this is um, when you have chronic drainage of purulent material associated with a perforated tympanic membrane. Um, and it doesn't have to be that the drainage is continuously coming out. It can be intermittent um, associated with when an infection might be present, but the perforated TM is persistent. And chronic, we define as more than two weeks um, per WHO and South Africa guidelines. It's still more common in younger children, but you can see it later in later childhood and adults too, um, like we see with HIV. Uh, usually the um, external ear canal has no edema or inflammation, um, but that can also be present sometimes as well. It doesn't usually present with pain. If you remember from acute otitis media, most of the pain comes from the pressure that builds up behind the tympanic membrane and really that's where the pain comes from. So once the tympanic membrane is perforated, there's really not a lot of pain. There is a large percentage of, of patients who have this that go on to have conductive hearing loss, about 50% even. Uh, most of the time, the hearing loss is conductive because of issues with the middle ear, with the ossicles, um, and the tympanic membrane being perforated. But you can see some sensory neural hearing loss, especially when ototoxic topical drops are used, like aminoglycosides, or maybe you're used, maybe <clears throat> the other thing also to always ask is um, if someone at home is putting anything in the ears, some of these ototoxic things um, can go on to damage the inner ear as well. Um, and I'll just say it's a nice time to just mention um, by the time somebody has come to you for chronic superative otitis media from home with a draining ear, they've probably already tried to put something in the ear at home, so it's good to ask what that was. Sometimes <clears throat> it can be what they're putting in at home that's making it worse. Um, and then another thing that can also cause chronic drainage or look like chronic superative otitis media is a foreign body. So young kids will stick things in places, and sometimes you might look with your otoscope and find um, a foreign body. Some risk factors for uh, recurrent, uh, some risk factors for this are similar to the other risk factors we talked about for just having acute otitis media or recurrent infection, and that's early age, um, living in a crowded condition or with a large family, daycare, poor nutrition even can lead to this, like low levels of zinc, selenium, and calcium, smoke exposure, um, frequent URIs, having HIV, measles, you know, depresses the immune system, and TB, diabetes, and cancer, and some baseline anatomical um, differences like with cleft, with a cleft palate. 
Um, and then also part of your education, um, bathing in contaminated water or ponds and rivers um, or swimming, uh, something to be sure to educate about because that can um, lead to this chronic infection as well. Um, chronic superlative otitis media does usually extend from acute otitis media that's not fully treated or is diagnosed too late. Um, a few different theories as to why this happens uh, is maybe there are different pathogens in the external ear that once the tympanic membrane is perforated, those can um, migrate into the middle ear and cause chronic infection. And those are different pathogens than what we normally associate with acute otitis media. Um, maybe these pathogens uh, form biofilms and that biofilms make it really difficult for antibiotics to get in. And maybe there's some baseline eustachian tube dysfunction that keeps the eustachian tube clogged. So it's really hard to clean out the ear. And really, um, <clears throat> the different pathogens can be an important role. And um, I saw a meta-analysis of sub-Saharan African patients who were cultured that showed a high prevalence of some of these other pathogens in these patients with chronic superlative otitis media. And that included things like Staph aureus, Pseudomonas, Proteus, Enterococcus, and anaerobes. TB can also be a very uncommon cause. I've never seen, I've never seen it. I don't know if anybody here has. But when you think like chronic drainage um, or chronic pus, TB could be the cause. Um, TB can extend into the uh, surrounding bones, and um, you could do a gene expert on some of the pus that's pulled out. This is not a common thing, so <laughs> I don't think like um, I don't I don't think that it's a common presentation that we see. But I just wanted to throw that in there because we do have a high prevalence of TB. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, okay, but you might also see with TB weight loss, fever, and sweats too. And hopefully something else would lead you to think that. So as far as treatment for chronic superlative otitis media, this is my last slide that I'll go over. Um, <clears throat> the mainstay of treatment is really trying to dry up and clean the external ear canal. And there's a couple of different ways that you can do that. Um, dry mopping or an oral toilet and ear wicking. Um, so dry mopping, is when you take like a soft material, like a cotton, like a cotton ball or, or a piece of cotton and you twist it into a long thin piece. Then you can insert it into the ear canal to soak up some of that moisture and pus. Then you remove it once, once it's soaked and, and make a new one. Then you insert the new cotton piece in there and you continue to repeat that until the cotton is dry. Then the ear canal is really um, clean and open and you can instill your topical antibiotic drops. Um, so that they can get to the places they need to go. <clears throat> ear wicking is similar. And with ear wicking, you would place a wick, which is also a small piece of thin material that goes into the ear canal. And usually, you know, you can use ear wicks when there's um, edema of the ear canal. And sometimes that edema can hold the ear wick into place. They can stay for up to a couple of days. And you can instill your ear drops onto the ear wick and they will flow down the ear wick and still reach the place where the infection is. Once the inflammation of the ear canal is, is gone, the ear wick will easily fall out. <clears throat> and then like an oral toilet might be something like gentle syringing of the ear um, to remove some of that debris. And you can use like sterile water mixed with a little bit of vinegar or peroxide just to clean out the ear. And these things you can do um, a couple times a week to get the ear clean um, is one of the most important factors for treatment. The other thing you can use are topical antibiotics. Um, so then you're using things like uh, ciprofloxacin otic drops or, or ofloxacin drops, as well as your oral toilet. <clears throat> Uh, in this instance, with chronic superlative otitis media, um, topical antibiotics are really better than systemic antibiotics uh, or oral antibiotics. And that's because at the point that somebody has chronic superlative otitis media, there's a lot of tissue damage, inflammation, and scarring, and limited um, vascularization around where the infection is. So give it, it's really difficult for systemic oral antibiotics to reach the infection. So topical antibiotics are key. 
This is an important thing just to note out. This is different than acute otitis media with a perforated tympanic membrane. With a perforated tympanic membrane, um, it's still an acute infection, and the infection is located mainly in the middle ear, and so systemic antibiotics and oral antibiotics are still key there. Um, even though there's the perforated tympanic membrane, you could still give um, topical antibiotics, but systemic antibiotics are key there. So just an important distinction. Um, the other thing you can think about <coughs> is surgical intervention. So that's really um, so one of your like more serious and last step approaches uh, if you need to be cleaning out some of the um, infected tissues around um, the middle ear. Uh, so treatment, or that's really for treatment failure, sorry. <coughs> um, treatment failure is when you've tried some of these things and it's failed after at least three weeks. Um, and that could be because the, the bugs that are present are resistant, the pathogens are resistant to your antibiotics. Um, maybe there's poor adherence because it is quite a lot that we're asking people to do. There could be a cholesteatoma that's actually causing a lot of the issues or HIV is still a really big problem there. So at this point, it's important to want to try and get a good culture again, and that's something that your anti-surgeons would be able to do. <clears throat> um, and when you're using systemic antibiotics after treatment failure, you're probably, you might want to use something a little bit more um, broad spectrum like linozolid, even to cover for that staph and pseudomonas. Um, if it still fails, this is really a time when you're going to be referring. If you're worried about something like cholesteatoma as one of the reasons, um, you might want to do a CT scan to look for bone involvement. Um, and that's when you would be thinking also about maybe surgical intervention. And then just again to say, education for these patients is super important about water precautions. Once the tympanic membrane is perforated, you want to avoid all water into the ear. So even with bathing or swimming, um, you want to avoid water as much as possible. Um, keeping the ear dry and clean is super important for healing. And then hearing loss. It's a huge morbidity in our kids, and they really need to do, <laughs> in order to do well in school, they need to be able to hear well. Um, so getting their hearing checked um, regularly after these infections is important. So that's all I have. These are my references. Um, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Mimi, for the excellent presentation. Let me just go through the questions. Um, the first question is from Jeno. It says, good morning, Doc, and thank you for the presentation. Is there any relationship between otitis media and wax? Uh, great question. Um, I would say I didn't read anything about um, research about that, um, but I will say that earwax is a normal, common like thing that our body does to um, clean the ear and keep the ear and its structures lubricated um, so that it so that the ear can function appropriately. So earwax isn't a negative thing, it's a positive thing. And so it's only negative if a patient has symptoms. So if they feel blocked or there's some hearing loss because there's too much earwax there or there's pain, you can think from a healthcare worker side to try and help them remove it. But otherwise it plays a really normal, um, helpful role in keeping the ear um, in it and its functions um, working appropriately. Okay, thank you. Um, next one um, from Patrick. Thanks for such an excellent presentation. Are the pathogens in adult acute otitis media similar to those in PEDS, or what about in HIV situations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, in adults, it's pretty similar. You may see different um, pathogens, but we're still, I mean, per our local guidelines and South African guidelines, we're still using the same antibiotics and we still, um, as first line, um, there could be different pathogens and there will be different risk factors. So even like smoking um, or being exposed to more environmental things can be um, more at play in adults. 
And you may think of also some underlying conditions that we don't think about in kids like cancer or some other reason that the eustachian tube is clogged. So I, I would probably refer <clears throat> a little bit earlier for an adult with recurrent infection if I'm not sure why they have recurrent infection. And then for HIV, um, the main thing, <clears throat> and I'll just say again, I think as a country, we've just done fantastic work at um, getting more kids on really great ART regimens and getting them suppressed because we don't see um, chronic superative otitis media like we used to. And I say that only being here since 2017, but at least even in 2017 and 2018, I saw far more cases than I do now. Um, but I think with HIV, it's just harder for the body to heal um, on its own. And a lot of times antibiotics help, but the infection could also, the body could heal it um, without antibiotics if there wasn't that baseline immunodeficiency. Um, so I think it, it's just a much harder infection to treat um, in kids with HIV. Okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Mimi. Next question from Juno. In the management of chronic superative otitis media, is there any need for culture before starting antibiotics? Yeah, um, <clears throat> no, not necessarily. I mean, I think, you you know, especially in our setting where getting a culture isn't always the easiest thing, and in chronic superative otitis media, getting a culture could even lead you down the wrong road if um, you're, you're swabbing, you know, the the pathogens that just naturally colonize the outside of the ear. Um, so I, I wouldn't get a culture until I've tried treating um, for at least a couple weeks. Okay. Um, next question from Patrick. What is your comment on the use of warm salty water or saline in the cleaning of superative otitis media, like in the rural areas? Would that be less toxic than topical aminoglycosides? Yeah, I think so. I'm, I mean, I'm not, <laughs> I'll just say I'm not an expert, but I think so. I mean, as long as the water is clean, um, like you're for sure it's clean, um, like maybe it's coming from the, the rural clinic or something from like sterile water um, or it's been boiled. But as, if you can ensure that the water that they're cleaning with is clean, oh, I think it should be fine. Um, you just want to also dry it out after you after you clean it with the water. So that, like I was saying with the with the um, dry mopping, so using like something like cotton that you're inserting to try and like dry it out. Okay, um, thank you. Next question from Bongiwe. Thank you for the presentation. Does this mean that in resource limited settings, it is no longer necessary to do routine pass swabs from the external ear in acute otitis media? Hmm. I, I first I'll just say honestly I wouldn't be doing routine external ear swabs for culture um, in routine acute otitis media. Um, I don't know if that if that's what you if you mean, um, then I wouldn't do that. But I am very curious to know if that if it's happening or how how exactly um, those are being done because. Uh, yeah, let me say that. <laughs> um, is that an answer? <laughs> I, 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 it's not. It's not in our. Um, at least I'll just say it's not in the Swazi guidelines to do that, and um, it's not something that we routinely do with our children with infections here. And in my experience, it's been really difficult to get um, swabs with cultures done. So I, I wouldn't do it until it's been until there's a complication or it's a recurrence. Okay, um, next question again from Gino. May you share your experience in the management of kids with hearing loss secondary to otitis media? Sure, um, so at least at Baylor, we, we have the benefit of um, our TB center and was able to hire an audiologist. So we have someone here who can, who, who presented last week, Tenzile. So whenever kids come um, with hearing loss um, or they're complaining of hearing loss, or we know that they've had these infections, 
we refer to her for hearing screening and she's been super helpful. Um, and maybe Florence, you can just like chime in about her availability. Uh, but that, that's that been our experience. We've had several kids who've gone and once they're diagnosed with hearing loss, um, she can provide options for um, if they need, what they might need to be more successful in life with their hearing. And sometimes that's been um, hearing aids and sometimes they're cost prohibitive and sometimes not. And so it's just a discussion based on what she finds um, when she does her testing. Okay. Um, and maybe just to chime in, um, if anyone on the call is concerned about hearing assessment for a child with acute otitis media, feel free to call our hotline or our main um, line at the Baylor Clinic at um, 2409-6000, and we can advise and link, if um, necessary, for hearing assessment, link the child for hearing assessment through our program, but do note that we might need to um, book them on particular dates. So please feel free to call and um, discuss and we can um, collaborate on how best to manage the patient. Okay. Um, next one from Kudzai. Is there a relationship between early childhood infections and otalgia that's recurrent and seems idiopathic? Hmm. Yeah, that's a really great question. I think you kind of stumped me there. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know um, really specifically. I'll have to look into that, I think. Okay. All right. yeah, I guess, um, sorry, it would make sense if there was acute otitis media and some damage had occurred um, somewhere within the tympanic membrane that um, there could be ongoing ear pain related to that. But I would also say that if there's ongoing ear pain and there's no signs of infection, you might think about some of these more, um, some of these complications I mentioned, like um, maybe there's a cholesteatoma uh, or something you can't see that's in the middle ear that sort of um, could be causing damage that's not visible. Why? Um, thank you so much. And then I've got a comment from Dr. Ngoi. Thank you very much for the informative presentation. Um, and I don't see any other um, any other messages here, but I do know there was an announcement from Dr. Matunjwa. So um, I'm just, okay, here it is. I think this is what has been posted. Um, so Tim, thank you for um, joining this presentation. Please join us in the next um, CMA session on the 16th of August um, on diabetic foot ulcers. The link has been posted on the chat. So please click on that link to register and um, let's reconvene on the 16th of August at 7 p.m. for the next CME session on diabetic foot ulcers. It will be presented by Dr. Mvuyo Matsawe Skonze. Thank you so much. Um, and have a pleasant day. Um, Dr. Mimi, 